a slightly unglamorous title, uh, I'm afraid, but uh, what I feel is a very important topic for today's gathering. Um, I'm not going to be talking about uh, the causes of fires in uh, cathedral roofs so much as how people over time, since the uh, 12th century, have responded to such fires and the solutions that were found uh, to the restoration of buildings um, after those disasters. I think there are two things that happen after uh, the calamity of a fire in a building of any kind, um, whether it be housing, um, a civic building or whatever. Number one is that uh, people say, this is terrible, this is completely unprecedented, um, and uh, are so alarmed by what has happened uh, that they hardly know what to do. Of course, the, the truth, as Tom has already um, implied is that actually these things aren't unprecedented. There's a huge history of fires in buildings, including fires in cathedrals. Um, and so uh, there's always something to be learned from what happened before. And after that, uh, filled with this sense of loss and trauma, people search for solutions. And I'm going to be very crude now in, in making a simple list of five possible solutions that people come up with. Um, I'm very much aware of the fact that over, particularly since the last war, um, there is almost kind of industry now in talking about uh, the, the language of restoration, the, the language of uh, reconstruction, what we mean by authenticity, what we mean by significance and so on. So forgive the crudity of my summary. Number one, there will always be those who say, why don't we just simply leave it as a ruin, or indeed just clear the ruins and leave it as a vacant space. Number two, um, there will always be the claim, uh, depending perhaps on how much has survived for those, from those who say that we should reconstruct um, what was there before as best we know it uh, from the archaeology of what has survived and from documents. Um, Number three, there will be those who seek for a reconciliation between uh, reconciliation and uh, new construction and will argue that uh, the realities are that that's what you're going to have to do. Uh, that, that it's a very empirical response. Uh, number four, very unusually... Um, there will be those who say uh, we should, that the building destroyed um, was so important that we should actually replicate it, maybe even replicate it on another site, um, on a museum site or wherever. And number five, um, the, the claims that uh, the building loss should be uh, rebuilt, but in a totally new idiom. Um, the idea behind that, the philosophy behind that being, of course, that the, uh, the symbolic importance of that building, whether it be a cathedral or whatever, is such uh, that we need to still mark that function uh, and that role in the city or wherever, in the landscape, uh, but it need longer, no longer be marked by um, a, uh, an exact reproduction of what went uh, before. So these are perhaps the kind of five categories which we're going to be chewing over between now and when the institution kicks us out. Um, and I want to now narrow the focus to just cathedrals um, and indeed narrow it even more because uh, there have been countless fires in cathedrals uh, since the 12th century, if not before, uh, and I'm going to come down to just nine fires, um, seven of them in English cathedrals and two of them in French cathedrals. Um, and as I've said, my, uh, my main interest is in um, the discussion that followed the fire rather than the immediate causes. Canterbury is the ideal place to start, uh, as uh, Tom has already uh, suggested because we have this extraordinary um, 
account by the Benedictine monk, Gervais, um, who may himself have been involved in uh, the rebuilding process at one stage, um, of the fire, the great fire at Canterbury Cathedral in 1174. Um, and he uh, meticulously tells the story of how a fire uh, broke out in adjoining houses, um, three houses, um, that people were wholly alarmed by this. They, uh, they eventually doused that fire um, and went home, not recognizing that the fire had actually spread to the choir of uh, the cathedral. Uh, and when they woke up the next day, they were to realize uh, that the, the cathedral itself was on fire and that it was indeed the, the choir uh, that was most severely damaged by that fire. And that is to say, uh, this region uh, between here, leading up through the uh, eastern uh, transepts here and into those two little... Um, adjoining chapels of St. Andrew and St. Anselm. Um, and what had happened was that the, uh, and this again is characteristic of what happens in these fires, is that the, uh, the timber roof catches fire um, and uh, it drops through uh, and ignites the choir stalls uh, and, and the organ loft in, in the choir below uh, and so the flames leap up. Uh, in this case, so Gervais tells us, um, um, he, let me just quote his words, the, flame, the flames multiplied by this mass of timber and extended upwards for full 15 cubits, that's 25 feet, scorched the, um, and burnt the walls and more especially uh, injured the columns of the church. But the fire there actually left the crypt un, un, untouched. Um, so it, it, here was something for future people to build on. Then we're told that there was a conference of masons, both French and English, caused by the, called by the, uh, the monk community of Benedictines, um, and that um, the... French mason, William Asson, gosh, this is a familiar story for architectural historians, but it's worth rehearsing it, um, was eventually chosen as the mason to lead uh, the rebuilding of the damaged choir. Um, he was chosen on account of his lively genius and good reputation. Um, the monks uh, had to be convinced um, that the choir uh, was too damaged to be uh, restored, perhaps as they uh, had hoped that it might be. And this is where we begin to get this interaction of uh, the memory of a destroyed building and the sentiments that are attached to that memory and um, the claims of reality of what actually you can do. And it would seem from the account um, that what William of Sons was able to do um, was to convince the monks that um, it had to be a, quite a substantial rebuilding, um, but that he would be able to retain aspects of uh, the surviving fabric. And um, if you go to Canterbury, um, you can see Come on. Um, you can see all around the existing choir of the cathedral in the part that William of Sons uh, worked on, um, how he reconciled uh, the surviving masonry um, with uh, what he obviously intended as a Frenchman and as someone uh, who was already informed about the development of, um, sorry, that's leapt on, um, of uh, French Gothic, that he obviously had in mind doing something uh, bolder, something closer to Notre Dame in many ways, with high vaults and flying buttresses, but that he was able to do that 
within the confines of uh, the width of the surviving building, the width of the aisles and the width of the nave, um, and the use of uh, the, the surviving fabric, as I say. And when you walk round, um, so I'm going to wander over, um, you'll see the surviving lower part of, here is the transept. Um, you'll see that up to the sill of the clerestory, uh, you're still dealing with the earlier cathedral, you see it here, and also in uh, the chapel of St. Anselm, um, there you'll see uh, the surviving fabric with the constraint within which um, William of Sons had to work. And you'll also see when you examine uh, the actual masonry of the aisles, uh, north and south aisles of the choir, you'll see the, the exact point of transition in the masonry between uh, brilliantly handled the way in which uh, William of Sons built up uh, the shafts uh, to continue to hold up new vaults but building on the original Romanesque shafts. And down below, a rather dark side there I'm afraid, uh, in the north transept you see this very ingenious way in which he took uh, the original uh, arcading of the Romanesque church uh, which had survived and retooled it um, to meet his new aesthetic um, and added little uh, Perkbeck uh, stone uh, colonnettes. So uh, here is, to my mind, uh, an extraordinary uh, work of reconciliation uh, between uh, the aspiration of memory and the desire to innovate. Um, of course, once you get further east in Canterbury, and once uh, William of Sons uh, had uh, left for gone back to France as, a, as an ill man uh, and had died and the so-called William Ed Englishman had taken over, uh, building further east, um, it becomes more wholeheartedly uh, a totally new piece of construction. Carlisle is fascinating. Um, uh, it's my one other medieval example. Um, because here we have uh, another fire, 1292, caused by arson in this case. I don't know whether it was the Scots or whoever uh, that set fire to the choir of Carlisle Cathedral. Um, but a very similar fire, and uh, without the, the same kind of account, um, but uh, we, we do know that, again, the roof caught fire. It dropped into the choir. Flames leapt up, damaged the arcade of the, uh, the choir, the central part of the choir, um, through the burning of the choir stalls and other fabric. Um, and what is um, interesting here, now here I rely on what building archaeologists have told us about what happened at, at Carlisle, um, is that it would appear that um, the masons responsible again, kept the outer walls. This is very similar to Canterbury. They kept the outer walls. Um, and, um, and so the aisles were, already, were there in place. But they took down the surviving aisle vaults and what, left, what was left of the main arcade of the choir and preserved the masonry of, those, of the arches of the main arcade rebuilt with new piers um, and then built up on top of that uh, the Triforium and clear story, as you see in this uh, photograph on the right. Um, so uh, another act of reconciliation, um, uh, but it, in a sense even more, um, even more conscientious because here you've got actually uh, uh, the reuse of old masonry which should be taken down, I presume cleaned, uh, and then uh, put back up again as the basis for something new. I hasten to add that the, the, the timber roof, timber and plaster roof, uh, is largely, um, as, you, as you see it here, is, is 18th century uh, with a colour scheme by Owen Jones, but that's another subject. So um, this is 
this can, Carlisle can stand as a fascinating example of kind of authentic reconstruction um, of reusing the old material as much as you possibly can. We have to talk about St. Paul's, I think. Um, I think St. Paul's, moving into the, the 16th and 17th centuries, um, is a fascinating case. Um, most people kind of start the story of St. Paul's knowing what was going to happen. Um, but if you, if you do as a historian ought to, um, and uh, forget that the benefit of hindsight and remember uh, what was really going on in the, in the mid-16th uh, through to 1666. Um, what you learn, of course, is that there were two fires at St. Paul's. Fire number one, um, caused by lightning um, in 1561, did severe damage to the medieval cathedral. Um, and the, uh, the famous uh, painting, part of a, a diptych uh, uh, commissioned by uh, a man called Henry uh, Ferry, um, in 1616, but you see uh, the panel there on the left. Um, Ferry wanted, was campaigning for the restoration of the fire damaged cathedral. This is campaigning some 50 years later. It was still in a terrible condition. Um, campaigning that James I should help fund and help support the funding of the proper restoration, above all, of the uh, the tower and spire of the medieval cathedral. And in this uh, wonderful painting, uh, you see the damaged spire um, with crows uh, passing over it, the dark crows and the, uh, uh, the, the symbol of darkness and the sadness of the destroyed building. Um, in fact, the, uh, the choir and nave had been re-roofed after that fire, um, the, the transepts only given temporary roofs, though. And eventually, again, as, uh, this is a familiar story, um, under Charles I, uh, there's the beginning of uh, what, the restoration of the medieval fabric, and uh, we're all familiar with Inigo Jones's uh, West End, which is where the story of that restoration uh, started in 1635. And that Jones uh, West End uh, was to survive, uh, although acutely damaged, uh, was to survive uh, the fire, the second fire, the fire of 1666. Um, and uh, there was always a discussion uh, about whether that too could be incorporated into uh, the uh, proposed uh, rebuilding. Um, the narrative of what happened after 1666 um, is uh, a, a subject of familiar to many architectural historians. Um, the enthusiasm that apparently there was for uh, the, uh, a substantial uh, rebuilding of the far damaged cathedral um, predated uh, the, uh, the fire uh, that occurred in uh, late 1666, September 1666. And um, it was only five weeks uh, before uh, the great fire um, that the meeting was held at um, St. Paul's, attended by Wren, John Evelyn, um, Roger Pratt, and others, to debate this whole question of how far should we go? Uh, should we start totally de novo, um, or should we um, attempt to do something with the fire-damaged building? And um, essentially, uh, as my quotation uh, from Evelyn's diary uh, suggests um, it was the uh, it was the case for substantial rebuilding that won. 
although that's substantial rebuilding, um, if you're to um, look at Wren's pre-fire drawing of the way in which he was going to handle the tower and turn the existing tower into a new cupola, as Evelyn described it, um, that was still uh, something which was still very much working with the existing fabric. After the Great Fire, um, the case for a total reconstruction becomes much stronger. And certainly, um, my feeling is, reading um, Wren's report on the, the post-Great Fire fabric, uh, that he becomes totally convinced, um, this is regardless of his own ambitions, his own architectural ambitions, that it was a hopeless case to try and retain uh, the, the old cathedral in any form. I quote from him uh, writing uh, in that report on the surviving fabric. The late calamity of fire has so weakened and defaced the building that it now appears like some antique ruin of 2,000 years standing, and to repair it sufficiently will be like the mending of the Argo Navis. Scarce anything will be left of the old. I need hardly remind uh, an audience of classicists such as this that the Argo Navis was the, uh, the ship that Jason and the Argonauts uh, used to go and search the Golden Fleece. Um, so it would seem to me that St. Paul's, it can stand in our, um, our litany of uh, cases uh, as an example of one where people over time and I stress over time because now we're talking about over 100 years of a history of fire damage uh, and debate about repair, had ultimately come to the conclusion that something totally new should be started. And the results of that we know from Wren's great model of 1672 onwards to the cathedral that we know today. So to York. York features three times in this narrative. If I can get the slide to advance. No, sorry. Um, and the first two fires at York um, were in 1829 and 1840. The first fire, uh, the work of an arsonist um, called Jonathan Martin, um, upset by uh, the more than upset, um, you know, uh, driven wild by uh, the worldliness of the Anglican Church, um, uh, stayed behind after Evensong, um, piled up um, the hassocks, uh, cushions, uh, hymn books, and so on, uh, 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 set fire to them, climbed out of a window, uh, and left uh, the uh, choir of York Minster to burn. And it wasn't until the next morning, this was February um, 1829, that um, a choir boy skating on a neighboring pond fell over and falling backwards and looking upwards, actually if he hadn't fallen up he wouldn't have noticed, uh, saw smoke coming out of the roof of the, of the minster and raised the alarm uh, that the choir was on fire. Um, and the story thereafter is the story that we've seen before at Carlisle and at Canterbury of uh, a timber roof, in this case timber, uh, timber trusses and a timber vault, uh, igniting, falling into uh, the choir stalls uh, and uh, they catch fire and so uh, the whole of the choir uh, was, uh, was burnt out and here on the left, you see uh, the scene the next morning. What is interesting to me about this case, and because we're now moving into an era of, uh, in the 1820s, where be the, you know, the beginnings of antiquarianism, the beginning of a kind of conservation consciousness uh, growing uh, amongst architects and uh, others, other interested parties, it's interesting that the architect 
uh, commission to uh, rebuild the vault and uh, furnishings and ceiling of the choir at York Minster, Robert Smirk, um, I think took it for granted that he would largely rebuild it in the form that it had been. And so he built um, timber. Uh, there you see in the top left there, uh, he built uh, timber, queen post roof over the, over the choir. Um, and he restored the choir stalls, the organ loft, and other features largely as they had been known. My slide in the uh, bottom left there um, shows uh, the surviving, one of the surviving aisle roofs um, of the choir, which weren't damaged um, in, the, in the fire of 1829 and um, are still there today. Then in 1840, another fire, this time in the nave. Actually, the fire started in the uh, southeast bell tower, uh, ignited by um, a, uh, a clock repairer from Leeds. Notice that it's from Leeds, not from York. There's always an antagonism between the two towns. Um, uh, leaving uh, a candle, a lit candle, in the uh, belfry of that tower, it ignites the timbers of the belfry, the fire spreads to the nave, the roof again um, is a timber roof, timber trusses, timber vault, collapses, it's a story as before. And um, in this case, Oh, Robert Smirk is invited back. He says, no, you can have my son, Sidney Smirk. He'll do the good job for you. And he does um, something not dissimilar to what his father did in the, in the choir. Um, he builds uh, an, a new timber roof over the nave uh, of uh, timber queen post trusses. But... What is interesting is in that process, um, he spots that actually there were large parts of the roofs of the rest of the minster which were severely decayed, including the aisles of uh, the, uh, the south and north aisles of uh, the, the nave and the north transept. And there, Sidney Smirk uses iron. And he goes to a York ironmaster called John Walker uh, to fabricate iron trusses. Um, and there in my right-hand slide, uh, you see one of the South Isle iron trusses, which is still in place and are performing extremely well. And there are even bigger iron trusses over the North Transit. So these, these were not directly the result of a fire, but they were directly the result of um, what happened next. Um, and it's, it's interesting. This is the first time that I find in, the, in England um, that cast iron is being used in this way in a cathedral restoration. It, it's to come up again. But if we really want to see iron in cathedral restorations, uh, we have to go to 19th century France. Um, and we have to go to Chartres, first of all, sorry. Um, and let's just go back to the fire itself. Come on, don't misbehave. Um, here we have th this hugely dramatic fire at Chartres um, in June 1836. Um, caused by two plumbers working on the lead roof, lead work of the roof, um, and uh, which burnt off the roof, but now this links into our story of Notre Dame. Of course, here we had a, a stone vault beneath, and uh, the nave of Chartres survived, and the medieval windows that we glory in today, of course, survived, despite this conflagration above. And the solution at Chartres um, was to build a cast and wrought iron roof um, and a, of a very dramatic kind which still uh, survives today, uh, designed by an engineer called Amiel Martin and which has been recently itself restored um, 
and is still functioning perfectly. At Rouen, um, the fire of 1822 um, destroyed uh, the medieval timber flesh. And uh, there, there was uh, a huge debate about the appropriateness of a new design for replacing that flesh. And the, uh, the architect, uh, Jean-Antoine Alavois, uh, designed a new spire, a new tall spire, a new cast iron spire. But it took some... 50 years to be completed. It wasn't completed until about 1881. And here you see on the right um, two images of uh, the last years of it topping out. Um, of course, that spa was subsequently destroyed um, in, uh, in the First and Second World Wars. Now, I think what is interesting about Rouen, I mean, quite apart from the story in itself, is that, that was one of the examples that Ville le Duc quoted of the inappropriateness of using iron in a cathedral restoration when the debate came up about uh, the restoration of the flesh um, at Notre Dame. Uh, because as, as Tom uh, mentioned, I mean, what Ville le Duc did, chose to do at Notre Dame, was to... Uh, try to his very best to recreate the timber flesh that had been uh, largely dismantled by, at the time of the French Revolution. Um, and as I say, at, the, uh, at that time, um, he was saying, I don't, want to do, I don't want to do what they did at Rouen. We will do it properly, and we will do it as a conscious, antiquarian uh, project, scholarly project, I should say. The number of cathedrals um, that were war damaged in the, in the First and Second World War is such um, that we could devote a whole conference to them. Um, we mentioned some already, Ras, uh, um, we could mention Rotterdam, Arras, Dresden, the list is endless. But obviously for an English audience, um, the one that resonates the most um, is Coventry, uh, and the bombing of Coventry uh, in uh, November uh, 1940, which still is, uh, is a kind of symbolic event of the Second World War for many people, uh, for those who, who hold these memories. Um, what for our purposes of discussion today, I think is really fascinating about the Coventry story, um, and what sets Coventry apart from the examples we've quoted already um, is that um, after that raid, after the destruction of uh, the cathedral or the interior of the cathedral, um, the two things happened. Number one um, was that that image of the burnt-out cathedral um, became um, a huge propaganda symbol of uh, the banality of war um, and of the, the crime against uh, um, uh, a, a small English city and its citizens, of course, portrayed as a small defenseless uh, English city. Um, and that, uh, that image uh, was flashed around the world and... Uh, so people, uh, in a sense, had locked in their mind this idea of sacrifice and a ruin symbolizing sacrifice uh, as never before. And indeed, um, those ruins um, became um, a garden of remembrance uh, in 1947, uh, and services were held in the ruins. Um, and so for... Um, People in Coventry, um, the ruin, the burnt-out cathedral, uh, became part of their memory of the war um, and of the sacrifice of the war. And 
um, I think what is, what is really um, what's important about this in terms of what then happened um, in the decision making about what should happen next um, is that, well, we know what the ultimate outcome was that uh, Basil Spence came up with the, a proposal which retained the whole of the ruined cathedral where services could still be held. Um, and built his cathedral at right angles to it. And in a sense, that was his mark of genius. I mean, that is what won him the job, uh, because he recognized how powerful that memory of the ruin was. Um, his predecessor, uh, Giles Gilbert Scott, um, who had been appointed in 1943 to design a new cathedral, um, did quite the opposite and in a sense was insensitive to that memory because if you look at the little image in the top left there, um, you'll see that what John Scott was doing was building a new cathedral across the ruin, um, retaining the tower and the apse, but actually in a sense um, uh, denying the importance of that memory. And it, for that reason, if for no other, um, Scott... Uh, was Scott's ideas were set aside, and of course, as you would know, he left the job in 1944. Um, so I think that is a very, uh, for me, Coventry is a fascinating example, and, and the debates which have gone on in the last couple of years about works to Coventry Cathedral, and indeed works to the ruins of the, of the old Coventry, um, I still resonate with this question of how do you use the memory of sacrifice um, that uh, still resonates from 1940. So finally, back to York. The, York, the third York fire, there probably were more, but the three that I'm talking about, uh, in, uh, 19, in July 1984, uh, we're now coming into the era when we're within our own memories, for many of us, um, burnt off the, the vault and uh, roof of the south transept of York Minster, probably caused by lightning or some electric activity in the atmosphere, certainly not arson. Um, and um, I think what is interesting here is that um, we had a, a timber roof and a timber vault, um, but it wasn't entirely uh, a medieval roof. It had been largely uh, rebuilt or, or reconstructed in the mid-18th century and then uh, again restored by GE Street in 1870. So the roof that was destroyed was not... It, we're getting this whole debate of, what do we mean by the authentic thing that has been lost? The authentic thing that has been lost was a mashup um, of medieval 18th century and 1870. Um, and part of the debate uh, that followed the fire of 1984 was uh, to what, what are we going to try and restore? And then, of course, what materials are we going to restore it with? Uh, should we, with the benefit of hindsight, uh, restore using uh, steel or reinforced concrete or, heaven forbid, GRP? Um, eventually, uh, the vote went for timber um, and for the kind of uh, scissors roof, scissors braced roof with uh, two collars that you see in the drawing on the, um, on the right there. And um, I th w th this is a fascinating case because uh, just touching on this question of authenticity again, um, authenticity has to meet head on the question of can you actually get the material um, that was originally used. And in this case, of course, the material was oak um, and, um, and was seasoned oak. But what was learnt uh, at York by the 
Arab team that worked on it um, was that they would never be able to get seasoned oak in the quantity and, and uh, sizes that they needed to do that job. And that they therefore had to use green oak. Um, and the, the genius for me of uh, that project was the idea that you could actually use, you could use green oak, but you could only do it by allowing for movement in the trusses. Uh, so the 13 trusses um, have um, on one side uh, roller bearings uh, at the bottom of the foot of the truss to allow uh, the, some movement in the truss um, as it dries out. Um, and in um, this image, um, you see uh, the prefabricated trusses on the bottom right there uh, going up. They were lifted, they were fabricated um, on site, lifted up by tall crane uh, and slotted into, into place. Um, and then uh, the roof covered in lead as it originally was and the roof, the vault, uh, again a timber vault uh, or a plaster vault I should say, a plaster vault um, uh, on a, a kind of metal grid uh, with uh, new bosses, except for six of the bosses which have survived. And there is uh, the vault uh, as you see it today. So here at York, we've got... Uh, uh, the claims of authenticity um, won out, uh, but authenticity had to make certain compromises with the needs of practicality, with the realities of what you could really do. So in conclusion, um, I persuade the conclusion to come, whoops, no. Um, I just want to end on a couple of thoughts. I think for many people, um, what was done at York Minster uh, represented um, the new consensus of how we would treat a building of that significance uh, after uh, a disaster by fire. Um, and that it was, uh, it was almost the ideal reconciliation of uh, the claims of the old uh, and the necessities of the new. Um, but, and there are going to be an awful lot of buts that are going to come up today, I'm sure, um, because I, I, I do feel equally um, that uh, the, the debate is still continuing. And what for me comes out of my nine examples from Canterbury right through uh, to the Third York Fire um, is that although um, our technical knowledge changes all the time, and we do indeed have new materials, new ways of handling timber, uh, uh, and totally new materials and glues and, and steels and so on and so forth. The debate remains the same. The debate is almost circular. Uh, and the debate uh, that was held at York um, was almost exactly the same as the debate that was held at Canterbury in 1174. Um, and so culture, the culture and the values come around every time, even though the, the practicalities uh, may advance. Thank you very much. Thank you.